Hey folks, it's good to be back with you again. It's been uh, a few months since I've recorded any new lectures to post here. I'm going to be teaching my uh, 641 Advanced Soil Mechanics class this fall at BYU where I teach. And uh, I've, I've received such positive feedback on hosting these videos online as a resource for my students, but but also for so many of you who are out there in industry or at university in, in some other location and find these lectures helpful. So uh, I've received a lot of requests to uh, finish the recording and posting of all of the uh, lectures that I prepared for this advanced soil mechanics class. And it, it's been on my to-do list. I've, I've really meant to do it this summer. Um, but you guys all know how that goes. Uh, <laughs> It, life gets busy and, and other things get in the way. But um, I'm following through on that commitment that I've made and uh, I intend to uh, be posting uh, the rest of these lectures here in the next um, few weeks, hopefully. Uh, so I'd like to kick things off today by just walking through a, a my initial lecture for the 641 class, which is just a basically a crash course review in uh, basic soil mechanics. And more specifically, um, in this class, we are going to review three basic tenets, three basic principles of soil mechanics. And these are the use of phase diagrams and weight volume relationships. We're going to review the principle of relative density uh, as they relate to uh, coarse grain soils and also the principles associated with Atterberg limits and a few of its applications to fine grain soils. So in this introduction uh, to the class and to just the, the review of basic soil mechanics, I'm only going to go through these three concepts, but these three concepts are big concepts when it comes to soil mechanics. These are like foundational pillars of soil mechanics so uh, they, they can't be overstated. Let's just uh, hop right into it and um, again if, if any of you know, everything I'm going to talk about is very superficial and rapid and fast because I'm assuming that you've already been introduced to these topics. If you have not been introduced to these topics jump on over to my other set of lectures for my CE341 elementary soil mechanics class and you can find more detailed lectures on each of these topics. So let's review phase diagrams. Now recall phase diagrams are just a very very useful way for us to visually represent all of the different forms of mass that comprise the soil. So if you were to reach down into the ground with your hands and scoop up a bunch of soil and just be able to analyze it and look at it, you would see that the mass you were holding could be separated into three different materials. You would have the solid soil particles, you would have the water that was in the pore space between the soil particles and you might even have um, air that was also in the pore space between the particles. So um, when you think of a phase diagram think of it almost as like uh, taking that soil that you pulled out of the ground and putting it into a glass that you could see through a transparent glass and then looking at it like you can see here in this picture. Um, that is, is uh, if we were to take that picture and then separate those three forms of mass um, into their separate parts, their their little, uh, I guess I would call it subdivided masses within our glass, this is what we call a phase diagram. And it, so it helps us understand what is comprising the mass of the soil. And really what it all boils down to, folks, is this component right here. This is the volume of the voids. And it, 
voids are the source of everything tr problematic, troublesome, and difficult and bad when it comes to soil. But they're, they also serve a very useful purpose. If it wasn't for voids, we wouldn't have aquifers. If we didn't have aquifers, we wouldn't have groundwater, and, and basically we'd all be dead from uh, uh, from desiccation, from, from not having any water to drink. And so voids play a very important role uh, in, in our lives as human beings. But as engineers, voids are very, very problematic too because all deformation in the soil that occurs from settlement, uh, that occurs often from... Um, um, compaction of the soil, all of those things, they, they occur due to the voids in the soil. So it's important then for us to understand the voids because the voids are going to govern and do govern almost all undesirable engineering behavior that's in the soil. So using these phase diagrams can help us visualize and understand how much void space is in our particular soil. So we will draw charts like this. This is a phase diagram and we can quantify a phase diagram either in terms of volumes of the different uh, quantities that are there in the phase diagram or in terms of weights. Typically we do both. And so uh, as you can see we have all of our volumes over here, the volumes total, the volume of the solids, the voids, and the volume of the voids is comprised of the volume of the air and the volume of the water. In terms of weight, we have the total weight or we have the weight of the individual parts which if summed together equals the total weight of our soil. Now we can combine and mix and match uh, these different quantities in order to, to compute some very very useful index properties of the soil. So these terms are very useful in describing the properties of the soil and they can be correlated to engineering behavior of the soil. So one of the most useful and, and, and commonly used terms is uh, something that's called the void ratio of the soil. So we use this term E to represent void ratio and it's simply the volume of the voids divided by the volume of the solids. Another term that's commonly used and that's related to the void ratio is the porosity and, and that is the volume of the voids divided by the total volume. So you can see there's a subtle difference between the void ratio and the porosity. So they're related but they're, they're definitely different. Another term we can calculate is the degree of saturation, S, and this is simply the volume of the water divided by the volume of the voids. So these three terms comprise the most commonly used uh, index properties that are based off the volume parameters. Now if we base uh, parameters off of the weights we get things like the moisture content which is the weight of the water divided by the weight of the solids um, we have the moist unit weight represented by gamma and this is just the total weight divided by the total volume of the soil and, and similarly the, the mass density is the total mass of the soil divided by the volume of uh, or the total volume of the soil and then the specific gravity of the soil is, is simply the mass of the soil uh, let's see, it, it is the mass of the soil uh, divided by the mass of water. Maybe I should write that in. Let's see, uh oh. Mass of the soil divided by the mass of water. So that ratio is the specific gravity and uh, for soil the numbers typically come out to be for sands in the range of 2.65 to 2.7 for clays 2.7 2.8 so even if we know nothing else about the soil we can um, 
estimate or guess the specific gravity and be really, really close. Now, in solving phase diagrams, there are what I like to call the two magic equations. These are the keys that, um, if applied, will almost always allow you to complete a phase diagram. So the first is this equation right here. Commit this one to memory, write it down in your notes, just remember it. it the volume of the solids is equal to the weight of the solids divided by the unit weight of the solids. Yes, that little term in the denominator, that is equal to the unit weight of the solids. We'll get to that more in a minute. But um, if you just remember this equation, it will come in very handy for you. And then the other very useful equation is the volume of the water is just the weight of the water divided by the universally known unit weight of the water, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Okay. Now, um, I, I introduced to you the unit weight of the solids. And let's just get this out of the way right now. One, one of the most common mistakes that engineers make in, in when they're learning soil mechanics is they get all of the different unit weights confused and mixed up. So um, we're, we're going to do a little bit of alphabet soup here, but these equations will hopefully help you. So first, let's talk about the moist unit weight. That's usually just represented with a gamma, or sometimes we see it with a gamma sub m. What this is, is this is the actual unit weight of the soil. Remember, it's the total weight of the soil divided by the total volume. So if, if you went out and cut like a, a known volume from the soil and weighed it, that weight you measured divided by that known volume would be the moist unit weight. So it has air in it, it has water in it typically, hence the moist part. Uh, it has solids in it. And so um, another way to think of this is it's the actual unit weight of the soil. So we can compute it with a couple of equations. There's different ways. Um, we can do the weight divided by the volume. We can use phase relationships to come up with some terms. So this is a very useful equation that's commonly used, the dry unit weight times one plus the moisture content of the soil or this is another commonly used term with the degree of saturation and the void ratio and the specific gravity. Okay, now the dry unit weight would be the actual unit weight if all of the moisture in the void space dried out. So if all you had in the soil uh, in the void space was air that was weightless, then and, and, and then you pulled out a known volume and weighed it and divided that weight by that known volume, then you would have the dry unit weight. So the dry unit weight is the same thing as the moist unit weight if the degree of saturation equals zero. They're the same thing. So the dry unit weight is a very useful term for us to quantify um, how compact the soil is. And so we'll often use that in, when we deal with compaction. So this is going to be the weight of the solids, not the total weight, but just the weight of the solids divided by the total volume. And then we have our uh, phase relationships with, that give us some other useful quantities here. Okay. Um, Similarly, but oppositely, the saturated unit weight is the moist unit weight of the soil if the degree of saturation is equal to one. In other words, all of the void space is filled with water. So if that's the case, then that's the saturated unit weight of the soil. And the equations that we can use to get that uh, are given here. So again, this is the total weight of the soil 
given that the volume of the voids equals the volume of water, in other words, it's, it's saturated. And uh, you can see in this term here, the moisture content is the moisture content when the volume of the voids is equal to the volume of the water. In other words, it's the moisture content when the soil is saturated. Okay, so hopefully you're following me and understand the difference between moist, dry, and saturated unit weights. Now, if we were to zero in, and um, let me just draw a quick little sketch here. So here's our um, phase diagram. So this is air, this is water, and this is solids down here, okay? So if I just focus on that little guy right there, and say, I want to know the unit weight of the solids. So I pulled the solids out of that glass and it looked like a little hockey puck. And I computed the volume of those solids and I computed and measured the unit that the weight of those solids. And I just completely neglected the air and the water. All I did was focus on the solids. Then that's what will give me the solid unit weight. So the solid unit weight is simply the weight of the solids divided by the volume of the solids. And as we mentioned before, it's equal to the specific gravity of the soil multiplied by the unit weight of water. Now, um, in geotechnical engineering, especially when we deal with the, the concept of effective stress, uh, we often are interested in uh, buoyancy. So Buoyant unit weight is simply the saturated unit weight. Whoops, why is that being erased? Strange. There we go. It's the saturated unit weight minus the uh, unit weight of water. Okay? So that's going to be our buoyant unit weight. And it's something that we can uh, use to calculate the effective stress if we're dealing with just a single layer of water. And finally, the unit or weight of water, gamma sub W, that's just the weight of the water divided by the volume of water. And it's universally known. Uh, it was a value of 62.4 pounds per cubic foot or 9.81 kilonewtons per cubic meter. Okay, so hopefully this little discussion uh, will clarify for you the difference between all the unit weights that we might encounter in soil. It all just depends on what assumption we're doing. Remember, these guys right here, all three of those, are essentially the same thing. The only thing that's different is in this case, the degree of saturation in zero, this case, the degree of saturation is one. In this case, the degree of saturation is what's actual in the soil. So it's like the actual surrounded by the, the two bookends. Okay, so in 641, um, one of my prerogatives is to share with you resources that I think might be useful to you in your practice. So this is a screenshot from a table in um, the NAVFAC manual. Now for those of you who don't know what NAVFAC is, this is the manual that was developed by the US Navy uh, to be used by naval engineers uh, for soil mechanics and, and uh, foundation engineering. So uh, it's used by the Seabees, uh, a very elite group of naval, uh, geotechnical, um, and, and civil engineers. Okay, so you can find these NAFAC manuals for free on the internet. Uh, back in the day, they used to be on a website uh, that was like Vulcan Hammer or some weird thing like that. I'm not sure. Uh, if they're they're still on on that strange website or not, but if you just search the name of this manual NAFAC 7.01, you'll find it on Google or on the internet. So this is a table that comes out of NAFAC. 
these these types of tables are really really uh, useful so all this is is a table of different phase relationships so in other words um, it what it does is it relates um, all let's just for example look at the volume of the solids all of these equations all through here are all equations that give you the volume of the solids these equations here similarly give you uh, the volume of water and so forth and so um, it's really helpful to have a lot of these different relationships when you're dealing with things that you know and things that you don't know and you're solving for your unknown so having these phase relationships can be very helpful to you here's another table from NAVFAC uh, very, it's the same thing but now these are relationships that, weigh, that, that relate to your weight properties and also your unit weights uh, and, and um, index properties relating to weight uh, from your soil so feel free to grab a screenshot or just go download the document yourself on the internet. Very useful reference to keep in your records. Okay, so um, what can we do with this information regarding phase relationships? Well, one of the most common things that we can do is, as geotechnical engineers are borrow fill problems. So these are problems where we're going to um, borrow soil from one area and we're going to uh, take the soil to another area so let's see if we can diagram what this is looking like so let's say I've got a low spot over here and I want to place some fill so I can borrow this soil and move it down over here so that by the time I'm done I have level soil but if I take this soil from right here and I compact it over here uh, when I dig up the soil it doesn't maintain its void ratio uh, it, it and, and if I I can place it and compact it in such a way that I can change the void ratio and, and hence the volume of the soil uh, depending on how dense I compact it. And so um, these types of, of problems, borrow fill problems, are very, very common. And you'll see them on not only the FE exam or the EIT exam in the United States, but you'll also see them on the infamous professional engineering exam, the PE. And so um, this is an example problem taken directly from one of the more famous preparatory manuals for the PE, Linda Berg's PE exam reference manual. And uh, I thought what we do is just uh, together walk through this borrow fill problem. So what we have, uh, let's just read the problem together. Borrow soil is to be used to fill a 100,000 cubic yard excavation. And uh, here is the dimensions of the excavation, 360 feet by 160 feet by 47 feet deep. The borrow soil that we're going to use to fill this, um, this excavation has these properties. A moist unit weight of 96 pounds per cubic feet, a moisture content of 8%, and a specific gravity of 2.66. Now, when we place that borrow and compact it, that compacted fill needs to have these properties. A dry density of 112 pounds per cubic foot and a moisture content of 13%. So given those constraints, we need to determine these things. How many cubic yards of borrow do we need for the fill? How much water needs to be added to the borrow? And assuming that a long rain occurs, what will be the saturated unit weight of the fill? So let's just go through. Now, um, anytime you solve a problem like this, it's worth your time to set up the problem and create a mental roadmap to how you're going to get to the solution. So here's my mental 
a roadmap for solving this problem. The first thing I recommend is start with a phase diagram for just the fill. And uh, you'll notice that they didn't give us any volumes for the fill. They didn't tell us how much we, um, uh, or, or, you know, we, we didn't tell us if we took a thousand cubic yards of borrow, what volume that was going to result in in compacted fill. So what we're going to do in these, when you have this type of case is just assume a unit volume. So we're going to assume a total unit volume, volume of one cubic foot uh, for our total volume of the fill. Now, after we complete the phase diagram for the fill, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to solve the entire phase diagram for the unit volume of the fill. And then, um, given what we know about the unit phase diagram for the fill, we're going to solve the unit phase diagram for the borrow. So you may be wondering, what is he talking about? So when I use this, this term unit phase diagram, what that's referring to is my, my total volume is a unit or one cubic foot. It's, it's, equal, it's a, equal to a value of one. So that's what I mean by a unit phase diagram. Okay, so here we go. Uh, let's, first, let's solve the unit phase diagram for the fill. So we already know, because we assumed, that the total volume is going to be equal to one cubic foot. Let's start with what we know. We, we know that the, um, that the weight of the solids is going to be equal, or the, the unit weight of the solids has to be 112 pounds per cubic foot. But if we know that the total volume is equal to one cubic foot in our unit phase diagram, that means then that the weight of the solids has got to be 112 pounds. Oh, excuse me, it's not the, the, the moist unit weight of the soil was 112, it was the dry unit weight uh, was equal to 112 pounds per cubic foot. So excuse me. So that means then that the weight of the solids is equal to 112 pounds. Okay, uh, another thing that we know, well, let's do the weight of the water. This is going to be the moisture content times the weight of the solids. We know that the moisture content of the fill needs to be 13%, and we just solve for the weight of the solids. So we can say in one cubic foot of our soil, we need to have 14.56 pounds of water. We also know that the weight of air is going to be equal to zero pounds. That's just an assumption we can always make. So now we're prepared to sum those together and get our total weight. It's just 112 pounds plus the 14.56 pounds, and that gives us 126.56 pounds of total weight in our one cubic foot volume. Okay, moving on. Remember the magic equation I told you about? We're going to put it to use. So uh, we're just plugging and chugging. The weight of the solids is 112 pounds divided by the specific gravity of 2.66 and the unit weight of water of 62.4. When we calculate that out, I get 0.675 cubic feet for the volume of my solids. Now next, we're going to apply the second magic equation I told you about. This is the, the equation uh, relating volume of water to the unit weight of water. So we have the weight of the water, we computed that at 14.56 pounds, and we know the unit weight of water universally is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. So that gives me 0.233 cubic feet of uh, volume of water. So if uh, that means then, uh, if I know the total, and I know the volume of the solids, and I know the volume of the water, then I'm only missing the volume of the air. So I can subtract the volume of the water and the volume of the solids from the total volume, and I can get the volume of air as 
0.092 cubic feet. So if I sum the volume of the air with the volume of the water, I get the volume of the void, which equals 0.325 cubic feet. So all those numbers add up and uh, they work out. So um, let's go ahead and, and solve a phase diagram for our borrow too, using the things that we know. So let's start again. Um, we know that the, um, oh, it, it's important that we, that we understand this. When we place fill, and the fill has the weight of the solids. Well, maybe let's look at this in, uh, in a sketch. Okay. If I draw the phase diagram, Uh, for the borrow, okay? And I take this over and say I compact it. So I really minimize and reduce the volume of the voids. My total volume may end up being something much smaller because I compacted the soil. So I removed some of the air and some of the water from my soil because I got my soil particles to be closer together. So maybe it would look something like this. So now this volume total it, and, um, is going to be less than this volume total because I compacted it. But the one thing that remains constant between both uh, the, the borrow and the fill is going to be the, both the volume and the weight of the solids. Compacting the soil does nothing to change the volume of the solids or the weight of the solids. So those volumes and weights in the solids are the same between the borrow and the fill. And this is a, a, a secret to solving these types of borrow fill problems. So if that's the case, I know for the borrow that the weight of my solids is going to be the same of the weight of the solids for the fill. It's going to be 112 pounds. I don't, by the way, know what the, the total volume of the borrow is going to be. Um, but I know what the moisture content is supposed to be. It's supposed to be 8%, and I can solve the weight of the water by uh, using that moisture content and the weight of the solids that I just computed. So together, that gives me 8.96 pounds for my weight of my water, zero pounds for air, so I get a total weight for my borrow of 120.96 pounds for every unit of um, fill that I need. Okay, so now we know that the, the total volume is going to equal the total weight divided by the moist unit weight. And remember, the problem gave us the moist unit weight. It was 96 pounds per cubic foot that was given. So I have the total weight, 120.96, and I'm dividing it by 96 pounds per cubic foot. So that gives me a total volume of 1.26 cubic feet. So get this, in order to end up with one cubic foot of fill at the specified density and moisture content, I need to start with 1.26 cubic feet of borrow. That's what I just computed. Okay, moving on. Uh, then the volume of my solids is the same as it was uh, for the fill, for the reasons we've already discussed, that the volume of the solids and the weight of the solids do not change between the borrow and the fill. So it's 0 0.675. The volume of the voids 
is now simply the total volume minus the volume of the solids. So that gives me 0.585 cubic feet for my volume of my voids. And if I have the volume of the voids, now I can use my magic equation to solve for the volume of water. That's going to be the weight of the water divided by the unit weight of the water. Gives me 0.144 cubic feet and now it's easy to solve for the volume of air. That's just the volume of the voids minus the volume of the water and I get 0.441 cubic feet. Okay, so now we've completed the phase diagrams for the fill and for the borrow. And now it's super easy. We can just go and directly compute all these solutions. So for part A, I need to know if I want 100,000 cubic yards of fill, how, uh, let's see, da, 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 da. I'm sorry, this shouldn't be fill, this should be borrow. There we go. How much borrow do I need? Well, uh, I just take the fill that I know I need and multiply it by this ratio of 1.26 cubic feet of borrow for every one cubic feet of fill. And that means that I'm going to need 126,000 cubic yards of borrow in order to fill that hole that I'm trying to fill in. <coughs> okay, how much water do I need to add to the borrow in order to, to make my specification in the fill? Well, I know that there's um, 8.96 pounds for every 1.26 cubic feet. And I have 126,000 cubic yards. So then I just have to do a unit conversion to convert those yards to cubic feet. And I end up with 24,192,000 pounds of water is in the borrow. How much is in the fill? I do a similar calculation uh, based on the moisture content of the fill and I end up with 39,312,000 pounds. So how much water do I need to add when I'm doing my compaction? It's just the difference between these two. So I compute the difference and I come up with 15.1 million pounds. And if I do a, a conversion from pounds of water to gallons of water that comes out to be about 1.8 million gallons of water that I'll need to add to the soil. Now let's assume finally that the soil is saturated when all the voids are filled with water so it, it rained a lot so the soil got saturated we want to compute what the water weight um, we want to compute what the saturated uh, weight of the soil is so Here's what we need to do. The volume of the voids in the fill is 0.325 cubic feet for every one foot of fill. We know that the weight of the water in the fill when saturated is going to be that volume, whoops, not sure why it moved forward, sorry. It's going to be that volume of the voids times the unit weight of water so it's going to be 20.28 pounds for every one cubic foot of total soil volume. We know that the total weight of the soil is going to be 112 pounds from the solids plus 20.28 pounds for the water when it's saturated. So I get 132.3 pounds. So if I want to know the saturated unit weight, I just take that total weight divided by the total volume, which I defined as the unit volume. So that means then that my saturated unit weight is 132.3 pounds per cubic foot if that soil were to become saturated. So hopefully you can see some applications in this type of problem and how in this type of problem is big business, big money when it comes to construction firms and, and engineering design firms. 
So a um, very, very useful type of problem that every geotechnical engineer needs to know how to solve. Okay, here's some more useful charts for you from NAVFAC. These uh, are some typical ranges of different types of soils, ranging from granular soils all the way down to organic soils. It has everything from um, typically the, the approximate uh, particle size from the maximum particle diameter to the minimum particle diameter in terms of millimeters. Um, it has uh, some sieve information like the D10, so 10%, the, the, the diameter of 10% of the soil um, that if you were to do like the uh, a sieve analysis and compute, um, this is the the diameter that corresponds to 10% uh, passing that sieve. So uh, that will give that to you in general ranges. And also you'll recall the uniformity coefficient C sub U. Um, it gives typical ranges of void ratios, of porosities, as well as um, unit weights, ranges of unit weights. So uh, if you know nothing about the soil that you're dealing with other than the type of soil that it is, then um, these types of tables can be some really useful estimates for you. Okay, let's move to the next topic that we wanted to talk about, which was relative density of granular soils. And this term relative density describes the density of a coarse grain or a granular soil relative to um, uh, it's 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 relative think of it like this it's relative to the soil in either its loosest state so if you imagine um, soil particles being separated as much as they can uh, while still staying in contact with each other um, this is as loose as the soil can get. Look at that void space. The void space can't get any larger than that. Or, and also uh, relative to the soil in its most dense state. So if you look at the soil here, uh, the void space is as small as it can get. Those particles are as close as they possibly can get uh, without the particles crushing one another and making new particles. So in this instance, we'd say that the void ratio is its maximum void ratio. And in this instance, the void ratio is equal to its minimum void ratio. The relative density refers to the void ratio of the soil relative to its maximum state and its minimum state. That's why we call it relative density. So here are some commonly used descriptors of relative density that, that are very common among geotechnical engineers. If your soil is uh, between 0 and 15% relative density, we would call that very loose. Between 15 and 35%, the soil is loose. 35 to 65 is medium dense. 65 to 85, it's dense. And if it's greater than 85%, we would say your soil is very dense. So here's a conceptual question for you to consider and, and maybe pause the video and think about it and feel free to write down your answers. Which soil parameters do you think correlate with relative density? Give this one some thought. Okay, are you stumped or do you have some responses? Here are a couple parameters that we know relate to the relative density. One is the friction angle of the granular soil. So uh, this is how much frictional resistance uh, exists between the soil particles, uh, between the grains of the soil particles. Another one is the elastic modulus of the soil, how compressible it is. Uh, how easily fluid can flow between the soil particles. So it's permeability. 
and how easily the soil can resist liquefaction when exposed to um, either excessive static shear stresses or cyclic shear stresses like from an earthquake. Okay, let's finish off this lesson with talking about Atterberg limits. So now, you know, relative density applies only to coarse grain soils, but Atterberg limits apply only to fine grain soils. So these are our clays and our silts. So we can't use relative density to characterize fine grain soils. Instead, we're going to characterize the fine grain soils with uh, what we call its consistency, and its consistency is related to the Atterberg limits. So all engineering behavior of fine grain soil is going to be a function of two things. It's going to be a function <laughs> of zooming my screen in, sorry. It's a function of the mineralogy of the clay, the mineral type. Remember, the mineralogy determines how um, likely the, the molecular uh, molecules of, of the clay are to interact with cations that may be present, as well as water. And how much water is present. So in other words, the minerals uh, that react with water and the presence of water, those two things are going to determine the behavior of fine grain soil. So Atterberg limits relate to both of these two things. And this is why we can characterize and often correlate the engineering properties of fine grain soils by looking at simply the Atterberg limits. So you'll recall Atterberg limits relates the change in the soil volume relative to the change in the moisture content in that soil. So there's a, there's a point where uh, if we keep increasing the moisture in the soil that the soil begins to expand its volume. Like the, the particles begin to um, absorb that water and begin to, the volume of the soil actually begins to increase. And um, Atterberg limits define three, three limits of changing the soil's apparent behavior. We have the shrinkage limit, which is um, the, the moisture content that corresponds to the point where the soil begins to increase in its volume. We have the plastic limit that um, Atterberg defined as the point, the moisture content at which the soil um, changes from a brittle plastic uh, behavior to, uh, I'm sorry, from brittle behavior to plastic behavior. And then the liquid limit is the moisture content at which the soil um, changes from plastic behavior to liquid behavior. And the difference between the liquid limit and the plastic limit is what we call the plasticity index. So you'll remember that the plastic limit we determine by rolling those little clay snakes uh, on the glass uh, the, the, the glass little plates in the lab. Um, and the liquid limit, we used the Casa Grande liquid limit device that I affectionately call the BOPO meter. And, and we measure how many bops it takes to, uh, 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 actually we measure the moisture content at which 25 bops on our BOPO meter will close a, uh, a small groove cut into the soil in the BOPO cup. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, go back and watch my lecture in 341 on Atterberg limits and you'll get a refresher. So again, the shrinkage limit is the moisture content below which the soil volume remains constant. The plastic limit 
is the lower limit of the plastic state and it's the moisture content at which the soil just begins to crumble when we roll a snake to a, a diameter of about one eighth of an inch and the liquid limit is the lower limit of viscous flow it's it's where the soil just begins to behave like a liquid or a fluid and this corresponds like i said to the water content at which a groove cut into a pad of soil in the casa grande liquid limit test device or the papo meter closes over a one half inch length when bopped 25 times and the pi is equal to the liquid limit minus the plastic limit that's the plasticity index so as i mentioned atterberg limits are super useful for geotechnical engineers for two reasons my friends the first reason is because they are very easy to measure any basic geotechnical lab has the equipment and the expertise to measure Atterberg limits in fine grain soil. And number two, because those Atterberg limits correlate very closely to useful engineering properties of the soil. Things like shrink swell potential, compressibility of our soil, and even shear strength. So here's some common descriptors of soil plasticity. Uh, if you have a PI of zero, we call it non-plastic. Sometimes uh, you'll hear people refer to that as sand-like. Um, non-plastic is typically more common. Low plasticity is PI from one to 10. Medium plasticity is PI from 10 to 20. High plasticity is PI from 20 to 40 and very plastic is plasticity indices greater than 40% moisture content. So um, Arthur Casagrande is one of the fathers of modern geotechnical engineering and one of his um, most significant contributions to our field was the introduction of the Casagrande plasticity chart. So in this chart, he plotted the plasticity index of thousands and thousands of soils versus their measured liquid limit from his Bopometer device. And what he observed were a couple of things. He observed, first of all, that all soils he tested fell under this line right here called the U line, uh, standing for the upper line. And then he observed that soils that exhibited clay-like behavior uh, were separated from soils that exhibited silt-like behavior uh, by this apparent line, the, what he called the A line, A for Atterberg. And so if we take that A line and we put another divider right at a liquid limit of 50%, that liquid limit of 50% is the dividing boundary between everything that is plastic to the right and everything that is not plastic to the left. So low plasticity, is uh, anything that is less than a liquid limit of 50% and high plasticity is anything that is liquid limit greater than 50%. If you're above the A line, you have clays. So CL is a lean clay, referring to low plasticity. And CH is a fat clay, referring to high plasticity. If you're below the A line, if you have liquid limit greater than 50%, you have an elastic silt, meaning it's high plasticity silt. If you are less than 50%, you have a, just a, what's called a typical silt. Now things get a little messy in this zone here, 
but in, in Casa Grande's original chart, he didn't have dual classifications. Those came later. Okay, what are some interesting properties that we can um, compute with Atterberg limits? So one of the more useful properties is computing what we call the activity of the soil. The activity relates to how active that particular fine grain soil is to the presence of water. And, and so the activity is really a function of how much clay content is in that particular fine grain soil. So um, to compute the activity, it's simply the ratio of the plasticity index of your clay divided by the percent clay fraction uh, of your soil. We get this from a hydrometer test. And we get, of course, the plasticity index from the Atterberg limit test. So in order to get the activity, we have to do two different types of tests. So to give you an idea of some different types of activities, um, the kaolinite clay mineral has an activity of about 0.5. It's pretty pretty constant, right around 0.5. Eolite ranges between 0.5 and 1. Montmorillonite, uh, a really active clay mineral, will have an activity that ranges between 1 and 7. So um, to show you what activity is graphically, um, we have to remember that, that Skempton was the guy who, who came up with activity. He's another one of our um, geotechnical founding fathers, and he's made a lot of contributions to soil mechanics and geotechnical engineering. So he would plot the plasticity index versus the percentage clay fraction of different clay minerals and he found that when he plotted those things they tended to have linear trend lines for different minerals. So when he computed the slope of the trend lines that was the activity. So the activity is nothing more than the slope of the trend line uh, between the plasticity index and the percentage of the clay fraction in a given mineral of, um, or a given sample of fine grain soil. Okay, one more very useful index that we can compute from the Atterberg limits is the liquidity index. And, and what this does is this normalizes the, the in situ or the in place water content relative to the range over which the soil is plastic. So this, this parameter is so easy to calculate and it's very, very useful for geotechnical engineers because it tells us a lot about the soil's sensitivity, meaning how, um, uh, how much shear strength will it lose if we strain it, and the soil settlement behavior. So here's how we compute the liquidity index. It's simply the moisture content minus the plastic limit divided by the plasticity index. So that ratio right there. So if the moisture content is much greater than the liquid limit and the liquidity index is greater than one, if those two things hold true, then the soil is very likely sensitive. And what that means is if I were to plot shear strain of the soil versus shear strength of the soil, the soil might peak, but then it would have a very sharp drop and this residual shear strength versus the peak shear strength. Uh, so sensitivity, by the way, in case you don't remember, is just the ratio of the peak shear strength divided by the residual
Yep. Okay, so if I have a very large drop when I strain the soil, um, then I have a high sensitivity. And um, I can predict whether my soil is going to be sensitive before I even do a shear test by just looking at the liquidity index of the soil. Okay, now if the moisture content is less than the liquid limit, then the liquidity index is going to be less than one. And if that's the case, the soil is likely to be over consolidated, meaning that if I apply a normal stress to the soil, it will compress, but it won't compress that much. But if the moisture content is less than or equal to the plastic limit, then the liquidity index is less than zero. The soil is heavily over consolidated. So this would be soil like glacial till that was um, consolidated and compressed under thousands of feet of solid ice, maybe in, in, in some glacial age in the past. Finally, if the moisture content is about equal to the liquid limit, then my liquidity index should be right around one. And if that's the case, my soil is likely normally consolidated or very near to being normally consolidated, which means if I apply um, an increase in the effective stress in the soil, it's likely to compress um, substantially. All right, folks, that is all I have for this lesson for you today. Um, I'll look forward to future lessons with you. Um, and again, as I record these, I'll be happy to add them to uh, the collection of lectures I have for this class on YouTube. So I hope you have a great day, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next lecture.